break. I'm Christoph Niedermeyer from the Paul Scherer Institute, which is one of the nine European neutron infrastructure providers, making up the League of Advanced European Neutron Sources. In this webinar series, leading experts from the LENS member facilities will give insight in their exciting instrumental projects and their visions on future developments. And today's speaker is Goran Nielsen. Goran is the polarized neutron scientist at the ISIS facility. In this capacity, he works on the three helium filling station, Flynn, and designs the designs of new polarized neutron instruments across the facility. This includes the well-known uniaxial polarization analysis option on the LET spectrometer. In his talk today, he will introduce the concepts behind polarized time of flight spectroscopy, discuss the differences between polarization analysis on time of flight spectrometers compared to other types of instruments and give some research examples the technique best lends itself to. Please be aware that the webinar is being recorded and streamed on YouTube. Goran's talk consists of three main parts. After each of them, the Zoom attendees will have the possibility to ask questions by either the raise hand or the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So Goran, we are all looking forward to your exciting presentation. Thank you very much, Crystal, for the introduction. And uh, thanks very much to the organizers of this series for giving me the chance to talk. So today I'll be telling you a little bit about polarized neutron time of flight spectroscopy. Uh, and I'll be starting with a brief discussion on uh, what polarized neutrons are and uh, how they enhance our experiments. Uh, then I'll talk about the LAT spectrometer, uh, describing some of the design choices we made, uh, leading up to the first experiments, uh, which were Quenz experiments on polymers, and in this case, uh, liquid D2O. And then uh, following that, I'll discuss some new data analysis approaches um, to, to, to get uh, the most out of powder uh, sample data. And I'll finish by giving some perspectives on potential future science drivers for polarized neutron time of flight spectroscopy and their implications for future instrumentation and software developments. So firstly, uh, what is a polarized neutron beam? Well, to start with, uh, the neutron has a spin of one half. And uh, when you place a neutron in a magnetic field, uh, that spin can either um, align along the field direction or opposite to it. And uh, these states, which are um, interchangeably called up and down or plus and minus or plus one half or minus one half uh, through the torque um, are what define the neutron's polarization. So if you go from a single neutron to a beam of neutrons, where you have uh, many billions of them, uh, the polarization, again, in an applied magnetic field is defined as the average direction of the neutrons, which here will lie along the field. Uh, and then it simply becomes a scalar, which is the number of neutrons pointing up uh, minus the number of neutrons pointing down divided by their sum. So the polarization, in other words, can range from plus one for a perfectly polarized beam pointing up to minus one for a perfectly polarized one pointing down. So how does a polarized neutron beam interact with a sample differently to an unpolarized one? Well, uh, the sample, uh, like the neutron beam, is also full of spins. And these can either have a nuclear origin or they can have a magnetic origin coming from the dipole moment of unpaired electrons. And uh, these spins, they can interact with uh, the spins in, in the um, incident neutron beam, and uh, they, can, they can affect uh, how that beam is scattered in terms of both the scattered cross-section and the scattered polarization. And uh, the distinct dependencies on the relative orientations of the beam polarization and the uh, sample spin polarization uh, between nuclear processes, so that's coherent processes and spinning coherent processes, uh, and magnetic processes can allow you to separate all these components in the scattering cross-section. And in the case of magnetic scattering, uh, it can also provide some information on the directions of the magnetic moments inside the sample. So um, there are three kind of general flavors of, of neutron uh, scattering with polarized beams. So one is half-polarized. Um, 
So that is where you come in with uh, a polarized beam, but you don't worry about the polarization of the scattered beam. And uh, what you're learning about then is uh, processes that affect the scattered cross section. So these uh, two typically result from nuclear magnetic interference, and they can provide you information about, for instance, magnetization in heterostructures. And this is something we heard about in the last webinar. The second flavor is longitudinal polarization analysis, where you come in with a polarization in a particular direction, and then you analyze the polarization of the scattered beam in the same direction. And uh, using this technique, we can access cross sections of this type where we see either the unflipped or the flipped neutrons with respect to a particular direction in space. And uh, this is uh, used for a number of things. Uh, among them, this example, uh, looking at the uh, polarization of excitation. So the directions that the spins are fluctuating in, in this magnetic system. So here it turns out that in, in some positions in the Brillouin zone, those fluctuations um, are, uh, have, have a different nature to in, in, in other uh, positions in the Brillouin zone. And the final most sophisticated uh, version of polarization analysis, the so-called polarimetry or spherical polarimetry, where you measure the full matrix of uh, the incident and scattered polarization, P plus minus alpha plus minus beta. And this is in, in a sense, the ultimate technique to allow one to access uh, very complex magnetic structures um, without any ambiguity. But in this talk, I'll be focusing on longitudinal polarization analysis. So how is this achieved in practice? Well, uh, the simplest example, I suppose, is that of a triple axis spectrometer. So here I've taken a very nice diagram of compass from the FRM2 website, um, just to illustrate the concept, but there are many of these in Europe. So the beam comes in from the uh, reactor, uh, in this case, over here. It goes through a polarizer in this region, and then it's monochromated, and then it passes through uh, some field regions, so including two flippers and uh, a guide field, which rotates the polarization into three orthogonal directions for going through the analyzer and then uh, polarization analyzer and then into the detector. So these three orthogonal directions are set up such that the X direction is parallel to the scattering vector Q, uh, Z is the vertical direction, and Y lies uh, in the horizontal plane. And um, going through such an uh, experiment, one comes in with a beam of a, of a defined polarization from the polarizer and the first flipper. It interacts with the sample. And then one analyzes, again, using the second flipper and the polarization analyzer, the direction of the scattered polarization. And uh, taking these up to 12 measurements, one can extract all the components of the cross section in most cases. So the coherent, the incoherent, the magnetic, which may have several directional components, uh, and possibly even chiral or, or nuclear magnetic interference terms. And uh, this opposes to normal unpolarized neutron scattering, where you just measure the sum, which can in many cases be uh, a bit of a mess. So this can also be done uh, on a more complex instrument, so one with a, with a two-dimensional multi-detector, but with additional difficulties, both in the analysis of the data and in the technical implementation. So the way this is done on, for instance, D7 at the ILL, there's also DNS at FRM2, so that you again come in with a polarized beam that you orient in three or orthogonal directions, and then you collect your scattering following these uh, uh, orange analyzer bank indicated here in, in a wide angle detector. And the crucial difference before is that now you can't conveniently uh, align your coordinate system so that Q lies along the X direction, which really greatly simplifies the separation of the cross sections. Because each, each, each uh, detector tube in this array will have a different angle between Q and the X direction. So nonetheless, making some assumptions and simplifications, this can still be done. And you can still achieve, in most cases, a separation of the coherent, incoherent, magnetic contributions to the total cross-section. Um, the additional technical difficulty here is that you need this huge 
wide angle analyzer. So traditionally these have been made of, of super mirrors like shown in this photo here. This uh, analyzer on D7 is in fact about two uh, tennis courts, I think, uh, of these mirrors. And uh, <clears throat> this comes with uh, a fairly uh, high cost, not to mention the difficulty actually depositing these things. So adding uh, a chopper, as is indeed possible on D7 to this configuration, you can turn this instrument into a time of flight spectrometer and you can do uh, very similar things, except now you, you also have the energy dimension as well as the Q dimension that you're measuring in. So for various reasons, primary among them flux, this is usually done with only Z polarization rather than full XYZ. So that reduces the measurement time quite considerably. And in that case, you can normally separate two out of three cross-section components, assuming that there is no chiral or nuclear magnetic interference scattering. So for instance, if you have a sample with coherent scattering and incoherent scattering, so phonons, in other words, in quens, perhaps, then uh, you can separate those. And uh, this has indeed been done a number of times. And a really nice example of it, I think, is this work from 2014 by um, Tatiana Burankova, DSI, working with uh, Jan Ems. And this was done on, uh, on an ionic liquid system consisting of these two constituents. And one of these uh, has no hydrogen in it and therefore scatters primarily coherently, whereas the other one is full of hydrogen and scatters primarily incoherently. And one can see the two quens contributions uh, from these constituents using polarized neutrons, uh, <clears throat> as shown in this diagram here, where the blue is the quens from this part and the red is the quens from this part. So uh, this very nice demonstration of the technique um, inspired me and many others to think about the other possible applications of it. And um, a number come to mind which are very technologically uh, and otherwise relevant today. And these include uh, batteries, for instance, battery cathode materials. Uh, you're worried about how the uh, sodium or the lithium diffuses through that. And um, polarization analysis can give you access to that very weak quen signal from that diffusion. Or for instance, biological systems, where you can use um, labeling using deuterium and, and hydrogen to highlight different uh, constituents of the system and, and there, uh, thereby with polarization analysis extract uh, their intrinsic dynamics. So this is all well and good, um, but it's only really been done in two dimensions uh, so far. Um, and the challenges uh, in extending to the third dimension, and, and this is of course very important because most modern time of flight spectrometers do have these tall position sensitive detector tubes is, um, are, are many fold actually. There's the broad incident spectrum that you need to polarize. There's the intrinsic low flux of the technique that I mentioned in the previous slide. There is a wide detector angle, not only horizontally, but also vertically. And then there's the data analysis and that I'll be touching on in the third uh, chapter of the talk. But if we can overcome all these difficulties, we have this fantastic opportunity to map uh, the dynamic scattering function of a material over a broad range in time and space with component sensitivity. And uh, I'll show you in the next part how uh, we're, we're getting partway at least towards that dream. Uh, so on that note, um, are there any questions? So you would have the possibility to raise your hand now or use the question and answer button, but I think the introduction was very clear and uh, I think you can move on to the next part, Goran. All right, <clears throat> I'll do so. So in this next part, I'll be discussing the LET spectrometer and our implementation of uniaxial polarization analysis on that spectrometer. So uh, firstly, LET is located on the second target station at ISIS. So here's the whole uh, Harwell site, uh, it lies uh, rather near Oxford, a bit more remotely from um, London and near the town of Didcot. And um, uh, ISIS is shown here. 
And we have on the left the old first target station, which is uh, now about 35 years old. And then uh, this relatively newer second target station, which is about, uh, what, let's see, 13 years old now. And uh, LET is located about here. And this is what it looks like. So LET is a cold uh, direct geometry time of flight instrument. So it operates in the energy range uh, incident between one and 25 MeV. And uh, its flexible chopper system allows one to select a resolution flexibly between one and 4%. Uh, the flux is uh, rather competitive. And uh, a real key feature of the instrument is that it has this enormous helium-3 PSD at the back of this tank. So this is a 40 cubic meter tank. And the detector bank, which is at about three and a half meter distance from the sample, is 40 square meters. And this covers a total of pi steradians and solid angle. Uh, another important feature of LET actually is the uh, chopper system, which allows one to select several incident energies from the same pulse and thereby to do uh, rep repetition rate multiplication. Um, so this is what LET looks like. Uh, one of my colleagues has called it a cathedral of neutron scattering. Here uh, is Rob Bewley, the designer and original instrument scientist of the instrument inside the, the tank. Um, and here is the instrument in the TS2 hall. So in terms of science, LET mainly focuses uh, on magnetism currently, quantum magnetism primarily, uh, looking for uh, things like exotic phases in, in this case, a one dimensional uh, magnetic system. So here are uh, some very exotic looking dispersions uh, taken in a magnetic field on a, on a ladder compound uh, with beautiful comparison to theory. And uh, about 15% of the time it does quasi-elastic neutron scattering. So looking at, at things like diffusion, rotational motions, etc., in uh, materials ranging from polymers to in this case, an ionic conductor, co copper selenide. So here we have the Q dependence of the quasi-elastic broadening with some cuts through it. And it's shown that uh, high temperature, this material undergoes a, a superionic uh, transition. So um, the fact that only 15% of the time is used for quens uh, is, in my opinion, at least a, a, a little bit of a shame because it's really an excellent instrument for quens. And one of the reasons for that is the uh, repetition rate multiplication that I mentioned before. So by measuring in this case on hexadecane, five different incident energies, one can cover a vast range in time. So here it's about four orders of magnitude in time, all the way from picoseconds to nearly nanoseconds in one shot. And um, this, is a, this is a distinct advantage compared to other uh, instruments typically used for coin studies, uh, where one has to, to either select many incident energies or go to even several different instruments uh, to achieve the same result. So in designing the polarized option for LET, um, we had a few basic uh, high level considerations um, going into the project. And one of those is that uh, we have this enormous, uh, amazing detector bank on, on uh, LET. And that uh, in adding new polarized neutrons is not something that we really want to, to compromise on. We want to take full advantage of that detector bank. Also, we want to cover most of the current science as well as some of these potential areas for expansion, like batteries and, and biology. But of course, the experiments also have to be doable in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, polar polarized neutron scattering, especially in elastic, is a rather flux limited technique. And so one has to choose quite carefully, um, not only how the instrument is designed, but what, you, what science you try to do on it uh, to ensure that it's, it's doable in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so the first decision we had to make was between doing uniaxial polarization analysis or full XYZ polarization analysis that I discussed before. And actually looking through the science case, I won't go into this in detail, but most of the current science we can actually do with uniaxial polarization analysis. There are a few cases that we can't, but actually quite a lot of those um, are rather detailed studies looking at uh, very specific regions 
in Q and energy transfer and therefore may be more suitable for a, a triple axis spectrometer in any case. And uh, some other huge advantages of doing uniaxial polarization analysis that we can cover the whole LET detector easily. And that um, if we focus on doing quens rather than some of these more challenging single crystal quantum magnetism type, type experiments, of course, we still want to be able to do those. Focusing on, on quens rather, uh, we, we are in a situation where we can do actually an experiment quite, quite quickly. So going a bit more into detail um, on the choices of the various polarizing and analyzing uh, elements in the beamline. So firstly, the polarizer, it uh, has to cover a wavelength range of uh, three to 10 angstrom, so an instant energy of about one to nine MeV, uh, giving a polarization of about 95%. And we have about 88 centimeters of space to do it. So that isn't, that isn't too difficult these days, thanks to advances in super mirror technology that's uh, rather easily done. Um, when it comes to the spin flipper, and we only have one of the, those on LET, uh, we wanted a high efficiency. Uh, and here, the space is a little bit more uh, constrained because uh, the space that we have left for the flipper is 88 centimeters minus the length of the polarizer. And then finally, for the analysis, this is where we, we put the most thought in. So we had essentially a choice between two technologies going for helium-3. So here's a demonstration of that uh, from HZB. Actually, this is done by Ulich, Earl Babcock. Uh, or a super mirror type device like this one on high spec uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab, which was built at PSI. And uh, weighing up the pros and cons of these, uh, only this one really would allow us, with current technology, to uh, cover the whole detector. And we have the added advantage that at ISIS we already have uh, this very nice helium-3 filling station, which provides us with nice polarized helium-3 to do the analysis. So, uh, so the choice was made to do helium-3 rather than super mirror. And uh, given all the extra material that that places uh, around the sample and in the beam, uh, the other very important criterion for the analyzer is to have a low background. So this is uh, the concept that resulted from those considerations. So here we have LET from the moderator to the sample, several choppers. And uh, we have here a few meters ahead of the sample, a removable section where we place the polarizer. This is uh, an M equals five iron silicon device with two channels and uh, Vs of polarizing super mirror in each channel. Then in this tiny gap between uh, the polarizer and the remainder of the instrument, we have the flipper, which is a perception coil designed due to the lab small amount of space available. And then moving across to the sample area, we have our sample position here in the center. The sample is sitting in a cryostat along with the helium-3 cell, which covers the entire LET detector. This is all sitting in a tank, uh, which separates it from the detector vacuum. There's just a single vacuum vessel on LET, the secondary spectrometer. And then outside that, we have a radial oscillating collimator to cut the backgrounds. And finally, a set of coils above and below the helium-3 cell to maintain it in a nice uh, homogeneous magnetic field. So now going uh, on to how this uh, actually looks in practice. So here is the, uh, the primary spectrometer. So the upstream uh, the polarizing uh, section. So um, this is what it looked like in my very simple drawing. And this is what it looks like in reality. So we have the polarizer here, uh, this uh, housing sitting on a, on a track, we allow it to be pushed into the beam with uh, relative ease. This can be installed in the matter of a couple of hours along with all the guide fields and the, the rest of the equipment. And following the polarizer, we have in this narrow gap, the flipper. Um, there's only six centimeters for it. And then we go into the guide field, which transports the polarization from the polarizer all the way into the sample area. As far as the performance of these elements goes, uh, the polarizer produces a very nice high polarization of about 95%. According to the specification, the flipper is also very highly efficient. 
And uh, beyond that, the transmission of the whole system is quite good. It's about 40%, maybe a little bit less, uh, across the wavelength range of the unpolarized instrument. Um, now onto the analyzer. So here is the uh, Flynn filling station. It outputs uh, helium-3 with a, actually it's a higher polarization than this, but this is what we get on beam on LET. Um, and uh, this produces hyperpolarized helium-3, which we then fill into the helium-3 cell. That's transported over to the sample, mounted on the tail of the cryostat like this. And then that's lowered into this tank that I mentioned, which separates all these elements from the LET detector vacuum. And um, this is it installed actually on LET. And this is what it looks like outside LET. So here you have coils, the collimator is behind the screen, and then you have the tank on the inside. And uh, you'll notice that uh, there's a system of rails mounted on the top of this as well, with a corresponding set of rails at the cryostat. So when we change the helium-3 cell, because its polarization uh, decays with time, hence also its performance, all we do is we attach the crane to this, we lift it up, we put some pins in to support it, we push the new cell in, and uh, we lower everything down. So cell changes can be done very rapidly. So having constructed all of this, um, our first attempt at testing it was on uh, this uh, solar cell polymer blend, P3HT PCBM. This is one of the standard, uh, most promising uh, polymer solar cell um, materials. And uh, in particular, what was of interest here was the dynamics of, I believe it is this side chain in the blend. Um, as you go from pure P3HT, which is, is this constituent, to um, this, this blend, which is shown here, this inhomogeneous uh, kind of mixture um, of, of these two um, constituents. And uh, the spectra are shown at a relatively low resolution uh, on the top. So here we have uh, delta E versus intensity for uh, a resolution of 84 microelectron volts on the top and about 41 microelectron volts uh, on the bottom. And uh, if we look first at the, um, uh, the pure P3HT, then um, we can extract, even though it's very weak, the coherent dynamics from the spinning coherent dynamics. And these coherent dynamics are thought to correspond mainly to the motion of this side chain. And you can see that even though it's narrow, um, that there are some um, dynamics associated with this element. But when you go to the mixture, then um, this dynamics is quite drastically suppressed. And this has some implications on the uh, performance of this particular solar cell material. So the next uh, experiment we did, and indeed the first user experiment that we did was on D2O. So just setting the stage a little bit for that first. Um, the intermediate length scale diffusion in water and glass formers is, uh, is a relatively unexplored field thus far. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that it's quite challenging to do. So um, even in deuterated materials, um, the coherent signal drops off quite drastically below the peak in the structure factor. And indeed, because deuterium has a small incoherent cross section, as well as a coherent one, um, the incoherent and coherent proce uh, processes uh, appear at a similar magnitude below this region of about um, one in Versangstrom. So um, some attempts had been made to explore this region with unpolarized neutrons before. So this was done on the IN5 spectrometer at ILL. So here um, the blue points are the uh, relaxation times extracted from D2O measurement. And the red points are those from, an, uh, from a protonated water experiment. And uh, the deuterated experiment, it shows as expected, a peak around the peak in the structure factor. This is a so-called Dijen narrowing. But then more surprisingly, it carries on going up at uh, smaller cues, at longer distances. And this is surprising because inelastic X-ray scattering indicates that it uh, should saturate to a value in the, in the range of a, of, of a few picoseconds, a very small Q. And uh, the fact that water behaves in exactly the same way 
that small Q um, begged the question essentially whether uh, these blue points were in fact probing incoherent dynamics rather than coherent dynamics. And of course, this is something you can resolve with polarized neutrons because you can separate those components. And this is what we did. So here is um, D2O at 295 Kelvin. Uh, this is S of Q and omega uh, incoherent. This is S of Q and omega coherent. So essentially a panel on the left here corresponds to the self motions, whereas the panel on the right is the collective and self mulch motions. And I should point out at this point, by the way, that this, this work um, I, I cited incorrectly in the abstract of my talk. Uh, this should in fact be physical research. Um, so uh, back to the data. So uh, the self motions, they show the expected broadening or uh, decrease in the relaxation time as you increase Q. Whereas the coherent uh, looks completely different to the previous slide. So here, uh, rather, you have this large broadening uh, around the uh, peak in the coherent structure factor, but something much narrower at small q. And analyzing this in a bit more detail, so taking cuts through everything and fit fitting it, uh, one can extract uh, the sort of revised curves, the relaxation time in um, D2O. And uh, one can see, firstly, that uh, the incoherent component uh, which is shown in the full symbols uh, in red, yellow, and orange, uh, essentially tracks that of uh, protonated water, which is shown in um, uh, the open symbols, whereas the coherent component, rather than going up alongside this, actually does flatten out and saturate to the value that is seen in incoherent X-ray scattering. And Aran Arbe and collaborators, they did a whole bunch of extra work on this with molecular dynamic simulations and now have a very nice self-consistent picture of the dynamics of water that was only possible to achieve um, thanks to polarized neutron scattering. And the other point here, uh, which is very important is that even if one deuterates the sample, it doesn't mean that one is looking at uh, entirely coherent scattering. So in fact, away from the peak in the structure factor where the ratio of the coherent to the incoherent is very large, uh, that assumption is, is not valid. So if one is interested in dynamics in this uh, range in, in Q or um, um, <clears throat> in coherent dynamics in general, then uh, polarized neutrons is really the way to do it. So on, on that, I'm finished with the second part and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, Goran, there's, uh one question from Arto Glavich here from PSI. So what is your experience with tuning the precision coil flipper for the wavelength frame multiplication operation mode? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So, um, so the issue is, is that one has, um, of course, a, a spectrum of neutrons okay. coming in other than a single wavelength. And uh, these flippers are normally only um, used to, to flip single wavelengths on monochromatic instruments. Um, so the way we get over that is that we ramp uh, the current in the flipper. Uh, so the form of that ramp is uh, some constant uh, divided by time. And um, we've developed uh, some electronics and software to do that and to optimize that ramp. And uh, it works very nicely. Uh, it, it, does that answer the question? Sorry, Pascal Dean asks, would you approach the project in the same manner? Uh, who, who asked, sorry? Maybe. Okay. Sorry, I, I may have missed the, the first half of the question there. Yeah, I also don't know exactly what Pascal wants. Maybe we can... Oh, um, uh, maybe you can was, raise the hand and uh, talk to us, Pascal, <laughs> if you would like to. Unmute. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, hi, Oran. Um, nice two session, sections of the talk. Uh, my question is, would you approach the project in the same manner? 
um, it, looking back on it. So as you know, we are trying to introduce something similar on C-Spec and I want to know what you would avoid doing. Hmm. Uh, let's see. So maybe um, the primary spectrometer section, the, the, um, this part could have been designed uh, differently. So we, we didn't look at perhaps the full range of options there that were available. And had we done so, we may have had a bit more space for the flipper, which uh, would have simplified that part quite considerably. Um, on this side, I, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm now convinced that uh, for this kind of application, helium-3 is, uh, is really the way to go. Um, because not only can you cover the wide angle, but it has some other advantages, like um, the fact that it doesn't modify the beam path. So um, mm. it doesn't change the resolution. Um, it can accept any divergence coming through it. It's very easy to correct and so on. And of course, you know, th this could potentially be done with, uh, with uh, say, a transmission-based supermirror device in the future. Uh, and and that, that may then become the, uh, the optimal choice. But, but here, I, I think uh, we're quite happy with, uh, with how we did that part. Super, thank you. Thank you. There's one more question by Jörg Voigt, and he asks how much beam time is assigned to polarization analysis experiments? So uh, there, there isn't a, a specific amount assigned to them. Um, we have had, uh, let's see, uh, five, I think, five or six accepted this year, uh, experiments that is. And uh, if, if I had to guess, I haven't actually uh, looked at the numbers. I'd say it, it currently constitutes maybe 10, 15% of the beam time. Okay, then I would say you have to move on to your data analysis part, I guess. Sure. Right. Um, so what I've shown so far um, is essentially enough to do polarization analysis on, on any non-magnetic system. So that means that of these uh, two additional classes of, uh, of, of system that I identified earlier in the talk, biology and, and battery materials, we, we can do biology uh, pretty well now. Um, we just have to try. Uh, on the other hand, for magnetic samples, things get a little bit more complicated, and indeed a lot of battery cathode materials are magnetic. Um, so to approach this, uh, let's start by considering a magnetic powder sample and assuming that it scatters like a paramagnet, and that's valid for most powder samples aside from, from ferromagnets. Uh, and then the uh, cross sections, the non-spin flip and spin flip, are made up of the following components of coherent, incoherent, and magnetic. So coherent is fully non-spin flip. Incoherent is one third, non-spin flip, two thirds, spin flip. And with the magnetic scattering, you get this additional term here, which um, depends on the projection of the polarization onto Q. And uh, in the case of non-spin flip, this is one minus P dot Q. And for spin flip, this is one plus P dot Q. So in two dimensions, one doesn't uh, have to worry about this too much because for uh, Z polarization, vertical polarization, P dot Q will always be zero. It's the scattering vector lies in the horizontal plane. Whereas uh, for X and Y, it can be simply parameterized using an angle alpha and um, uh, this magnetic component can be broken into these three parts for X, Y, and Z, which look as follows. So not worrying too much about the details of this, one can essentially take linear combinations uh, of these for X, Y, and Z um, to arrive at a, a full separation of all these cross-section components. This uh, is of course uh, not the case on a, a, a multi-detector instrument like, uh, sorry, a PSD um, detector instrument like LET. So here we have this vast detector array. 
with uh, 100,000 pixels in it. And uh, if we pick a random pixel here and, uh, and look at the, the scattering into that pixel, not only are we seeing um, um, the elastic scattering, but we're also seeing inelastic scattering. And because the, the length of the, of the, uh, uh, the, the final um, neutral momentum uh, changes within elastic scattering, we get a whole range of, of, of cues. So not only does each of these pixels have a different elastic p dot q, but uh, each time channel in here also has uh, a different p dot q with respect to this third term here. So what we're looking at now is, is many thousands, in fact, um, greater than 10,000 different projections p dot q measured even in a powder experiment. And uh, this goes up to, to hundreds of millions in the case of um, a single crystal experiment. So on the one hand, that means that we have a lot of data, which is uh, inconvenient to deal with. But on the other, it also means that we have a lot of information. We just need to, to find a sensible way to put it together um, to extract what we want from it. So um, these are some very preliminary attempts at trying to do that. So. Um, what has been done here is uh, I've simulated uh, using this very nice ramp software, which is uh, kind of like McStas for GPUs. I'd recommend you to check it out. Simulated the uh, elastic cross sections for holmium titanate, the famous spin ice material, including some incoherent scattering and some nuclear frag peaks and so on. And, and uh, tried to see whether I can extract all the cross section components from this data. So here is the non-spin flip component. So you see it has some Bragg peaks shown by rings here in the detector. You have the magnetic component seen here at low Q. So this has this characteristic shape because uh, of this P dot Q squared term. And you can see this because uh, if, you, if you look at uh, Q as you go up and down the detector, it acquires a, a larger or smaller vertical component. And of course, the vertical direction is the direction of the polarization. And so P dot Q changes as you go up and down the detector in, um, uh, in, in a systematic way. And you see a similar result for the spin flip. So here you see uh, on the left, the non-spin flip, a decrease in the intensity because that term is one minus P dot Q squared. Whereas on the right, you see an increase because it's one plus P dot Q squared going out of the horizontal plane. So um, this is of course a powder sample um, which means that the scattering around uh, a Debye shatter ring shown here uh, should be the same, or at least is the same in the case of a non polarized experiment. But of course, now, because we have all these different P dot Qs going up and down the detector, uh, we measure uh, a variation which comes from the magnetic signal sitting on a, on a flat background essentially from the incoherent nuclear components. So um, one way to try to get all the information out, so separate all the components, is to plot the dependence of the intensity going around such a ring with this angle phi. And this is shown here. And here we have on the bottom um, the, let me see. So that's the non-spin flip part. So that decreases out of the equatorial plane. And the spin flip part, which increases when you move out of the equatorial plane. And uh, you can simply write down analytically expressions um, given the detector geometry and so on and, and fit these quantities out. And that works pretty well. Um, another more convenient way to do this, given that you have to do it 100,000 times uh, potentially, is um, to average the data across, uh, say, a region in phi. So here is region two in the spin flip. Uh, if we average the uh, the, magne uh, the sorry the signal across that region, um, and do similarly for this region, and the same for the for the spin flip, you can write down a set of matrix equations. Of course, here we have three unknowns, so we only need three observations, and then you can extract all the cross section components by inverting this matrix. And um, I tried doing this quite recently last week. And uh, this is what came out. So um, the black lines are the 
um, expected result. And the, the blue line is what you get from the matrix inversion and red from the fitting procedure. And you can see that in both cases, you can, uh, rep uh, you can reproduce the cross-section components uh, with very good fidelity. So at small angle, it's better because you have a larger variation in the scattering and you see more of the Dubai shower cone. Whereas in, at large angles, sorry, it's a little bit poorer. But in, in most of the angular range, and even for a small spin and coherent scattering relative to these two other components, um, everything can be reproduced to within a, a few percent fidelity. And uh, that brings me to the end of part three. Yeah, let's, and I'll just for one question uh, by Arthur again, very active today. So have you considered using a tilted field direction to maximize the measured P dot Q range? A, a tilted what, sorry? Uh, uh, momentum versus Q range, uh, the tilted field direction. Uh, yes, that, that, would, uh, that would certainly be interesting to do. It's not something we can do with our, uh, with our current coil set. Uh, but but I'll, uh, that's, it's a very good point again, and it's one I'll, I'll touch on in, uh, in the next section, in fact. Then he asks, uh, does your analysis take into account three helium depolarization over time and different beam, beam pass lengths through the three helium cell for uh, different uh, vertical it, components? Uh, uh, it does indeed, yes. Uh -huh, good. And, um, and then uh, a question from on, David uh, Hamm. But what sorry, would be your approach to background subtraction, for instance, from a neutron absorbing sample? Uh, background subtraction from an absorbing sample. How you, how you would deal with an, an, a neutron absorbing sample? Yeah, and yes. Corrections. Uh, that, that's, that's, a that's a little complicated because it, it would actually uh, affect um, what you end up seeing in the detector. So I, I guess there, um, what one may have to simulate by, say, Monte Carlo, the, uh, um, the influence of the absorption on um, the signal in the detector, then correct for that, and then um, go through everything. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's, that's not so trivial. And there's one question by Pascal, and maybe we allow Pascal again to, uh, to ask this question herself. Sure. Uh, it's a, it's Pascal, a, the mic is open. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, you have some oscillations in your spinning coherent scattering on your last slide. Is yeah. that an artifact from something? Where, where does that come from? Uh, so these, yeah, this is, um, this is essentially because of, uh, it's, it's a numerical effect. You'll see it's well out of the, the error bars. Mm. comes from the matrix inversion. So it, it comes essentially from uh, how well conditioned these matrices are, mm. how close they are to singular. And uh, the further out you go, the closer they get to singular. So the more oscillations you get uh, due to numerical error. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, then we can move on. Go on. Right, um, so I hope that I've shown you that uh, polarized time of flight uh, has demonstrated its potential for quens on protonated and deuterated systems. And uh, that uh, doing polarization analysis is crucial when looking for weak scattering or for coherent quens. Um, so the next obvious steps to do uh, are to attempt biological samples. Indeed, before the uh, pandemic, this is something we uh, were intending to do. On, uh, on LET, and also to do battery materials. As I mentioned, many of these are magnetic, so one would need something like this uh, technique uh, that I just show you to uh, extract all the cross-section components. So we're basically ready to try these things now. But um, if they are successful, we, uh, we need to build user communities um, to use them. Uh, that's crucial. And uh, we, we also, shouldn't forget that um, one of the main businesses of LET is doing sin single crystal magnetism. It's, uh, we have tried it once. It's difficult on the current instrument because of, uh, because of the fluxes involved, but there's certainly more uh, development to do there. 
so given that, um, if polarized quens ends up being uh, successful, then um, it will uh, demand more instrumentation to do it. And uh, perhaps the direct geometry time of flight, although it has the, the advantage of a multiple repetition rate um, mode, uh, isn't ideally suited for some systems where the dynamics might be slower, like the biological ones. So there the flux is, is simply too low. And um, therefore it might be uh, interesting uh, to try building a polarized indirect geometry in this machine. And indeed there's been a lot of development on that front recently with uh, instrument proposals like Mushroom uh, from Rob Buley and this has been taken up at FRM2 as well, where you have this huge uh, array of analyzers going into a PSD. And uh, crucially, uh, the scattered beams, they all focus through a point at some stage. And uh, that in a sense is a very natural place to put a polarization analyzer. It can also be put around the sample, of course. And, um, and therefore implementing polarization analysis on, on this kind of instrument uh, is, is perhaps relatively easier uh, compared to a direct geometry instrument where you have to perhaps um, uh, cover uh, a bigger solid angle or, or do so at a, at a greater distance. So of course, new direct geometry time of flight instruments also offer an awful lot of new op uh, opportunities, particularly relating to the, uh, to the more traditional use case for uh, polarized neutron scattering, uh, polarized inelastic neutron scattering. And this is gonna require some uh, thought about new coils and, and field arrangements. So this kind of relates to what uh, Arshur brought up uh, just now. So um, uh, I, I think it's very important that we maintain um, full views of, of these, these huge detector banks in this type of instrument. And, uh, and so there's, there, there's a design challenge there to, um, to achieve uh, more field directions uh, without obscuring the, uh, the detector. Uh, there's, of course, also still development to be done on, on wide angle analyzers. There are some new super mirror uh, geometries for, for, uh, for that purpose, which have been proposed recently. And uh, it'd be very exciting to see where those developments go. And we also need better wide angle helium-3 cells. So um, the ones that um, we're using on LET are, uh, I think, the largest of their kind in the world. And because they are so large, uh, they have to be manufactured by, um, by a different method to usual. So they can't be blown. They have to be welded together. And uh, this may affect their performance. And there's, there's quite a lot of optimization to be done there. So finally, on the data analysis, I, I hope that the last section has demonstrated that virtual experiments can help to test new approaches. And I think uh, that should go along with the design of these new instruments. Uh, new field environments uh, in particular. And uh, simulation tools like RAMP or MixTAS are, are very useful in that sense. But of course, we also need more experimental data to practice on. Uh, <clears throat> so we have taken some data actually on holmium titanate uh, that I showed the simulations on earlier. Uh, so th that's these images here on the right. And uh, this is under analysis at the moment. But it looks broadly similar uh, to, to the to the simulations. Um, going on to single crystals, th there is a framework for analyzing single crystal data using XYZ, the XYZ method. But again, one might question whether there are different field arrangements uh, or, or, or a different way of doing things that could achieve the same uh, in, a, in a better way. So this is not something I've, I've thought about a great deal, but um, just having seen how much you can get from a Z polarized only experiment, it does beg the question, um, is there a simpler way of doing things? Um, also, how much can we achieve with Z polarization only on single crystals, especially in high symmetry systems? So I, I mentioned earlier that we have done an experiment. Unfortunately, that data isn't ready to show yet, but it has made us think about some approaches that we can try there uh, involving uh, taking uh, essentially a misaligned crystal where you have uh, many uh, points with similar Q, but with different P dot Q spread across the detector, and, and somehow taking the data from all those points and comparing it to get the cross-section components. 
And then finally, I mean, this feels almost obligatory these days to mention machine learning. Uh, but essentially, in, in this case, I think it's, it's quite natural because what we are essentially doing is comparing images and looking for features that are in common or different between those images. So uh, there's a huge amount of uh, work been done on, on that uh, using machine learning already. That's kind of the, the specialty of the method at the moment. And so maybe we can harness some of those uh, to, um, to do pol polarized neutron uh, separation. So to conclude, um, I, I've hopefully demonstrated that polarized time of flight spectroscopy is now a useful tool to study dynamics of component sensitivity, so magnetic coherent, spinning coherent. The instrumentation and analysis are now mature to try biology and battery materials, but there are of course still many improvements to be made, better analyzers, data analysis amongst them. And uh, if uh, polarized quens ends up being uh, a, a big thing that takes off, and that may drive new instrument concepts, such as um, doing polarization analysis on the indirect geometry time of flight spectrometer. And uh, all of this work means that, of course, there are many opportunities for collaboration, both within LENS and, uh, and internationally. And uh, I, I've hopefully demonstrated through the talk as well that all of the LENS institutions have uh, contributed in some way or other uh, to, to development of this uh, technology. So um, before I, I thank you, allow me to thank my um, collaborators on all these projects. So on the ISIS side, um, Mark Davenport, Ross Stewart, and the uh, LET instrument scientist Rob, and David Venetian, and the uh, engineer and detector scientists have, have all been very important. We've had a number of students working on the project as well. Um, and a lot of the work I showed is from Gino uh, Casella, and then excellent technical support. Uh, the D2 project was done with Arancha Arbe and Juan Colmenero at the uh, University of the Basque Country. Uh, and the Holmium Titanate was done uh, with Robin Perry, Sergeant Arslan, and uh, David Venetian uh, at ISIS. And then finally, the uh, polymer work was done with uh, Vicky Garcia and uh, Giuseppe Paterno. And uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Goran. I think you really lived up to the high expectations that I had in your talk. So it was very nice. Thank you very much. And there are three questions now. And I start with the one from Andrew Wiles. He says that your out-of-plane analysis method looks good for a sample that has a strong magnetic signal and a weak nuclear spin incoherent signal. How well do you think it will work in the opposite case? Um... Yeah, um, you, you, you do kind of rely on there being a variation uh, going across the detector to be able to do the, the separation. Um, so you, you need for there to be some variation here. So, uh, so presumably, yeah, that, 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 it, it, that does make it a lot more difficult um, for uh, weakly magnetic samples, but it's honestly not something I've tried yet. Then a question by Arantxa Arpe, so uh, important question. So pushing toward low Q would be very relevant, e.g. for soft matter and biology. How could this be achieved? Uh, well, all, all of this technology um, can be put on, on essentially any instrument. Uh, polarization analysis is, uh, is pretty ubiquitous across uh, neutron instrument um, classes. So if, if one were to design um, sort of specialized small angle uh, direct geometry time of flight spectrometer, then, uh, then that, could certainly, uh, that, that could certainly be done. Good, then another one by Arthur. So he said yeah, there was a proposal by Werner Schweiker to use pi half flippers before and after the sample to generate a defined processing spin before and after the sample to access other polarization components. Have you looked into this possibility for LET? Uh, not yet, no. Uh, another good point. And, and this is actually something that, uh, that came up in a, in a discussion with Werner um, earlier this year. So it's, uh, it's, it's certainly an interesting suggestion um, and uh, it deserves looking into. 
Yeah, and then I have one final question by Wai Tung Li. So he asks, would you consider flowing polarized free helium into the analyzer cell instead of exchanging the cell? And also what may be done to increase the T1, the relaxation time to extend the time available for taking data between cell change? So um, initially we went for the option of, of changing the cell just because of uh, simplicity. Um, and uh, indeed, it, it only takes about a half a minute to do so. So I mentioned that uh, the polarization on beam is a, maybe a little lower than we'd like it to be, about 65%. And some of that could be to do with the transfer. And as a result, it may be uh, possible that doing a transfer into the cell from a, uh, from a re remote rig sitting on top of the instrument uh, loses less polarization. Um, so it's, 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 it's again another thing to look into. Um, yeah, as, as far as the second part of the question goes, um, we, we have done a little bit of work on, uh, on trying to understand why um, certain materials and certain preparation methods give good relaxation times T1 and others give poor relaxation times. Um, but it seems to be a, it's a very complicated question. It's got to do with the, the surface chemistry of the glass, which uh, shows uh, a lot of variation even between batches of glass. And um, although we've made some improvements, we've, we've gone from initial T1s in, in low tens of hours up to now about 60 hours. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and that's hopefully something we'll, we'll, we'll pick up again soon once, uh, uh, once the pandemic situation allows, essentially. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any further questions. It's, I think, noon now here in, uh, in Switzerland and lunchtime. So thanks a lot again for this really nice talk. And also thanks to the audience for the discussions and, and uh, your participation in these interesting discussions. And please stay tuned for the next webinar, which will be roughly a month from now. Yeah? Goodbye now. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, goodbye.